Welcome back to Lift the United Panels. This is an amazing, amazing panel that I'm extremely excited for. I believe this is our World Next Door panel, and this is the third World Next Door panel. Today, we're going to welcome Ananya and Lauren to the panel. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to show really quick the books. So the audience knows the books that we're talking about. This here is Red String Theory. And I wanted to do a little bit something different this panel. Lauren, I was wondering if you can pitch us your amazing book. Sure. So Red String Theory is about an artist who believes in the red thread of fate, which is a Chinese legend that goes um, two people who are destined to be together are connected by an invisible red thread. And the red thread will never will stretch and tangle, but it will never break. And it's between uh, the book is between this artist and a systems engineer at NASA named Jack. And the two meet on a magical night in New York City, brought together by fate or coincidence, only to be lost each other by the end of the night. Mm, I love it. Next up, we have Ananya. Please give us your pitch for your amazing book. Yeah, um, so Kiss My Connection has a little bit of a similar theme of destiny and fate as Lauren's um, book. Um, so Kiss My Connection follows Madhuri Iyer and Arjun Mehta, two childhood best friends who have only ever been platonic in every sense of the word, except Madhuri gets this prophecy from her family that the first person she ever dates will be her forever love, and that's the last thing she wants. So she decides to loop her best friend into a fake dating experiment to prove the universe and her destiny wrong, and unfortunately, she does fall in love at the end of it. So that is how the story goes. <laughs> The best kind of stories. Fix their little thing here. I'm going to put myself aside so you guys can have more. That was amazing. Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to start off with the question I ask every author when they come on, and this is for both of you. What inspired you to want to choose this profession as your career? A career author. I'm going to call on Lauren first. <laughs> yeah. So I... I do balance writing with a day job and I think about that all the time. And I think about, I talk about it with people all the time. It's something that um, figuring out that balance has been such an interesting new challenge recently in my life. Um, and it has changed from book to book. So when I wrote my first book, Lunar Love, I um, did it kind of in the margins, but I started it before I had a full-time job. So I had a lot of time to really nail that story down. And then I edited it while I had a job. Book two, I woke up, uh, book two, which is Red String Theory. I woke up early and I stayed up really late. So to me, that really felt like I burned the candle on both ends. I don't know how I did it now. I look back and I'm like, how did I wake up at 5 a.m.? I was so young. And this was only a few years ago. And I would wake up, I would go to my job, I would come back and I would write some more. And I did that, I felt like a fever dream with how fast I did that. And I feel like I just I wrote it so quickly, I edited it so quickly. And then for this, the, my next book, my third book, I am still trying to figure out what that looks like. I write now at night, I'm trying to be more sustainable and have a more healthy approach with it and take care of my mental health. And that looks so different than any of the other books that sometimes I'm like, am I doing this right? I know there's no one right way, but it's a new challenge every single time. Um, but I've always loved to write. And I grew up going to my parents' office, sitting in the conference rooms, typing away on my typewriter and would just create stories and create uh, kind of more like fantasy stories. And then I wrote a lot of nonfiction and it wasn't until... I wrote Lunar Love, a version of it that wasn't a rom-com. It was more um, relationship fiction. And I was like, I miss writing fiction. I work as a technical typewriter, user experience writer in my day job. And I just wanted a creative outlet, something that would give me more, uh, more of a world to escape into at the end of the day. Okay. I'm like, it's a lot going on. When you talk about juggling a full-time job with this career and we don't really get to see the full picture of that, of what that entails. What's the day to day? What do you go through? And more authors are talking about how they're struggling and how they're trying to maintain, because to be honest, guys, this doesn't pay <laughs> like we would like it to. 
you know. True. Yeah. What about you, Ananya? Um, so similar sort of again story here, but um, I've been writing ever since I was a really young kid. Um, I come from a huge family of engineers who don't read or write. So everyone in my family was really surprised when that was like my hobby of choice. Like my sister would go out to play and I would be the one sitting at home writing and reading books. So um, I just kind of kept doing it because I was in STEM fields for most of my life. I grew up naturally enjoying science, but also naturally really enjoying English. And for me, I couldn't really get one or the other without feeling like I needed an outlet. So when I did a lot of English, I kind of felt like I needed the logic of science. And when I did a lot of science, I felt like I needed the creativity of English. So they always kind of went parallel for me throughout grade school and high school. Um, but then in high school, I wrote on Wattpad. And that was my outlet when I was studying for my SAT because um, my Asian mother was very upset when she found out I was writing instead of studying. So her um, kind of deal with me was you can write, write on Wattpad, you know, do what you need to do, but you also have to study and do well on your SAT. And if you can do both, then I think you've proven to me that you can always be a writer and whatever job you want to be on top of that. So I kind of took that. I ran with it. Um, my first book was a thriller, did relatively well on Wattpad, and um, I wanted to publish it. So I actually sent it out to literary agents when I was 18 years old. And it didn't really get a lot of love, but that book was also not really meant to be published. That book was for me at 17 to figure out that I wanted to write with everything else going on in my life. So I'm happy that I didn't go anywhere. I'm really glad it's not really out in the universe. Um, but someone did tell me when they read that book that they thought the romance was more appealing than the thriller. And so then I took that and I was like, you know what? I'm a freshman in college going through so much stuff and like so many changes right now. What I need to do is write. So I wrote that romance novel, which ended up being Kiss My Connection when I was between 17 to 18 years of um, age. The pandemic happened and I was like, well, I have a lot of free time on my hands now. Let me send it to agents. <laughs> and then I got my agent and then I got my book deal about five months after I got my after we went on sub and things just moved so fast. And now I am writing and in medical school and I am constantly finding new ways to balance those two passions in my life. But it's just been writing my whole life and it's all I've ever known and it's all I want to continue to know. So it's worth it to continue to balance it with everything else. I'm curious because you started really young. I mean, like, <laughs> and, and your follow through is amazing. <laughs> I, I didn't have that sort of follow through at that age. Was there a particular <laughs> author or a book that really pushed either of you to say, I'm going to try this, that gave you that what is the word I'm looking for, that gave you that motivation um, to actually push through? But Anan, okay. yes. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure. Um, so I, I talk about this a lot, but Kiss My Connection is comped to When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. Um, when Dimple Met Rishi is the first YA romance book I ever read that had an Indian American like main character and love interest. And that was a big deal because typically it's just one or the other. It's never both. Um, so that was the first one I saw where it was them, them getting their happily ever after. Their culture was on the forefront. And I think my restriction in writing up until that point was no one's going to want to read it unless I have characters that don't look like me in it. And reading that book was what kind of showed me, no, actually, you're limiting yourself here why don't you try writing the book that has two Indian characters falling in love? You know, maybe that's not a cliche. Maybe people do want to read it the same way you wanted to read it. So um, that's kind of the big push off point for me. And I remember even emailing Sandhya Menon at the age of like 16 and being like, I'm going to do this because of you. And she actually responded. And it just makes me so happy every time I think of it. Amazing. What about you, Lauren? That's so sweet. Um, and I love that she responded. Um, Amazing. I read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert in, gosh, I don't even know, before I started writing fiction, really. And the idea that ideas find you and they kind of like, like it's sometimes a little like woo woo to think about and like, but like they're like coming around, they like find you and it grips you. And I found that to be so inspiring of like, I have an idea, um, whether it's like a nonfiction piece or a fictional or an idea for a book, I can like, 
I don't have to look so hard for it. I just have to live my life and ideas will come. And I truly felt that with Lunar Love where I was like, I want to see myself in a book similar to Anand and your story of like, well, people want to read this. And I was like, I'm hungry for it. I still am so hungry for um, representation, mixed race representation in books and movies and TV shows everywhere. And I was like, oh, when I was growing up, I learned about the Chinese Zodiac and that seed just like came to my mind. And I was like, and I met my husband online and there the seed would kind of like worked together to be born and it truly felt like big magic. So that book. <laughs> That's cute. That's really cute. I'm like, I, I love talking to romance authors. You guys make me so excited and giddy. Like, you know, you feel, hmm, how much of that lingers over into real life for you? <laughs> no, really, now I'm going to make this a real question. What you write in these books, how much of it do you experience in your real life or do you hope to experience in your real life? And how much of it bleeds back into the book? Anyone? So, yeah, <laughs> so for me, I will just kind of go back and forth on Anya. Yeah, um, yeah. I... Definitely, there's there are parts of my husband in every love interest that I write. Ooh. He's he's definitely <laughs> the hero of my life, and he's just he's the best. And I met him online, and I do love to tell a story because we I was someone who would never go online dating. I was so nervous about it. I had my fears in Lunar Love. I poured all of those fears into Olivia, calling it digital purgatory. I was so nervous. I had just heard horror stories, but I was living in New York City and I had third wheeled my sister and her now husband three too many times. And literally we got back from like an Asian food fair. And that night I was like, sit down, we're making a profile tonight. So they helped me create that profile. And I like set rules for myself. I signed up for a six month subscription, paid up front, gave myself guidelines and boundaries. And uh, he was the first person that I met on the app and he was the first um five like five days after i had signed up for it and then our first date was five hours long and then a few days later we canceled our accounts and i had to pay for the six months still but like totally worth it we're you know almost 10 years later here we are and um he is he's definitely an inspiration and i do there is a moment in red string theory where Rooney is so nervous about her art being out in the world. She has uh, writers or creators, writers. I definitely put some of myself in there too. She has <laughs> artist block. And it was a basically like a one-for-one -one conversation that my husband and I have where I'm like, no one's going to like it. And I, no one's going to come to the installation is what Rooney says. And he's like, well, how many people do you need to like it? How many people do you need to love your work? And I, and Rooney was like, well, if, if it, touches one person, if it means something to one person, that is what, like, that will have been worth it. And that is like a direct lift of our conversation. My husband has a master's in psychology. He knows how to talk me down from things like, and I, so that one scene in, it's in a rocket garden in Florida. Um, they're on like a little tour for the, a NASA artist residency. And so he, he's definitely a big inspiration in, in life and in my books. Can I just say, first of all, thank you for sharing that with us because, you know, I feel like there is still a, a bit of stigma around online dating and oh, yeah. is online, but hello, success story, come through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's so beautiful um, and it totally makes sense why you write romance. If you have a love story like that, hello, let's inspire more. Um, and nice. it does seem very much like fate. The first person you talk to so wild even when i think about it and he wasn't even supposed to be in the city like there were incidents that led up to it for him to be there so just the timing of it beforehand when we didn't even know each other was also really wild yes we we need mm -hmm. the uh, <laughs> look i'm like we need to the details for all the yeah. single ladies out there the single girlies we need the details yes. of uh, whatever prayer you put into the uh, universe <laughs> what about you and <laughs> Well, that is so cute. And it does sound like you guys have your own red string, which I think is so adorable. I love stories like that. 
Um, for me, obviously, I was really young when I wrote my first book, so there was no husband or love story in my life at the time, but I wrote Kiss My Connection based off the biggest love I knew at that time, which was my parents and my sister. So the family in that book is such a big deal. Um, my main character is so connected to her parents and her sister. They are her biggest love story, and they are what brings her her second love story, which is her romantic one with Arjun. So I really wanted to bring out that theme of like love comes in so many different forms, especially when you're a teenager. It's not always going to be the boy next door. Sometimes it's your sister or your best friend or your parents. So I really wanted to bring that out. But then as I got older, I did meet my own boyfriend. Um, I've been with him for about a year now. And I always tell him this, that I didn't realize it when I was writing all these characters, but I was writing him. And I was writing these characters as a vision of what my perfect love story would look like one day. Like one day when I'm older, when I'm lucky, this will be my person and I'm going to wait until I find that person. And he is everything I've ever written down on paper. And he likes to say I'm like manifesting him into my life. But that is more or less what happened. A lot of the way that we met, on how we talk to each other, sometimes follow lines from my book. Like he said things that I've written on paper that I've never heard anyone say before. And he's never read any of my books up until he met me, right? So um, I will say now a lot of my love stories do come from him. And it's really interesting to look back on what 17 year old me thought was true love and then start to see it happen in my own life too. I think it just brings another layer of like taking that childhood innocence of love and then adding the reality of actually experiencing it as a young adult and kind of melding the two together to get a more realistic representation. So cute. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm the whole time I'm thinking you're manifesting because you think you're manifesting a book deal when you're writing this book, but you are really manifesting your partner. It okay, was, girl, I, take notes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of people don't realize how challenging and also long the publishing of your book from conception to actual publication, how long it can be. So I wanted to know, know if you can share what it was like, that publishing journey for you, um, and if you were able to sort of um, find your voice in speaking up for yourself when it's time to uh, go, go to bat for your, for your storylines and with your editor and with your publisher, and if you can share, Ananya. Yeah, of course. Um, I will say um, my publishing journey started pretty fast. I got my agent within two months of putting Kiss My Connection out there, and then um, she gave me a contract three days after she asked for the first 10 pages. So it moved very fast with Anne Leslie. And I knew she was the one, like she's the perfect agent. I could not be luckier. But um, so that's how that started. And then we revised for two months and then submission was also only five months. And I got a two book deal and I sold an anthology in the middle of all of that. And so everything was fast, fast, fast. And then Kismet Connection came out in 2023, in June, and a month later, my publisher Inkyard collapsed. And it collapsed overnight. And it collapsed with no warning. Um, all the staff was less, let go. All the authors weren't told until we saw the Twitter thread the morning of. It was just a nightmare of a situation. And suddenly, everything just went so slow. And no one really prepares you for when things go from 100 to zero. Um, especially when it's kind of coming up in a way you never really expected. So right now, my second book was supposed to come out June of this year. It's coming out June of next year in 2025 because I had to get a new editor, become friends with my new editor, trust her to read my writing, especially as a woman of color writing about really culturally significant things. Like that relationship takes time to grow before you're ready to trust it and really put your all into it. So I will say Publishing is something you can try to predict and you'll still really never hit it on the nose because the way it was going for me, the, all the calculations and strategy, my book was supposed to be out this year. And now I see it as like a new beneficial thing because in giving myself the extra year, year to release my second book, my voice as a writer has gotten a lot better. It's gotten a lot more mature. I've given myself time to look at this book as more than a companion to my first book, but as something that has its own message, like separate from the Kisma Connection universe. And I think that's something I wouldn't have allowed myself to do if I didn't have thinking time. So that's 
I guess the bright side of that. As for standing up for yourself, I will say your agent plays a huge role in that. Um, most of the time I tell my agent when I'm unhappy and she just like <laughs> verbatim says it, but says it out of like with her email signature. So it's like, okay. Um, but I will say having an agent that's ready to go to bat for you, having an agent that knows when to talk you down and when to go swinging is super important because sometimes you also have to be okay with compromising in publishing. And that's the best way to get to your end goal, to get to making sure that book gets to the correct reader. But sometimes your agent is also really, really important for saying, no, this is not okay. We need to stop it right now. And she does that for me whenever I need it. So I feel really lucky in that regard. Fun fact, these two share the same agent. <laughs> which I did not know until afterward. And I was like, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Says a lot. I, I'm gonna come back to Ananya because what you, what you talked about is something that not many have had the opportunity to experience and probably never want to experience. You had your publish, your book came out and then your publisher gone. And I, I think about you a lot when, in that regard because I always think, you know, I felt like your book was supposed to be way bigger and way more successful than it was, but you, you know, you lost a huge part of that. And, you know, I'm like, what could it have been? Do you ever think to yourself, what could it have been had this not happened? And how do you prevent yourself from really like getting down into the, like, into your feelings about this is my debut, this happened to me, you know, how do you stay level and give yourself grace? Yes, I think that's easier said than done. It's a very good question. Um, it is something I've been asking myself ever since it happened because, you know, right when the collapse of my publisher happened was when I had my white coat ceremony and started medical school. So it was like one thing really amazing in my life and the other side of my life, not writing related, was happening at the same time that something really devastating was happening in the writing sphere of my life. Um, I think taking a break and allowing yourself to actually step away from publishing and shut down and go into a hiatus of sorts was the best thing that I ever did for myself. I needed to figure out who I was outside of the 19 year old who got a book deal because that was what people were calling me for so many years. And I think that's why people had high expectations for my debut because I was young. I was the same age as my audience. And so there was a lot of unpacking of like, well, now you're 21. You're coming out with the second book. You're no longer this prodigy set up by like your publisher. Your publisher is also gone. All your industry contacts that you had that you were so close to are gone. What now? And who are you without that? So I think I took six months to just not write and to not do anything and to just sit by myself. And now I feel a lot better, a lot more optimistic about my career. I look at my second book as my second coming as like a chance to actually put out work that I feel reflects me at 22 years of age when I have more life in me, more words in me. Like, I just think I'm better capable of handling this industry now. So I think there's always a bright side, but I think you can only get there once you wallow for a little bit and give yourself the space to be upset that something happened. I think that's the best way to get through anything. Very beautiful. Lauren, I'm directing that question over to you. Publishing, tell us more. <laughs> sure, I'm like, whoa, so lost in that answer of like, beautiful. Um, just the the whole identity element of writing and how it, um, it's just so different from maybe like there's like a before time and an after time. I'm not answering the question right now, but I am <laughs> like, now I'm thinking about that. Um, it's a, it's a heavy topic for sure of like how your identity takes shape once you become kind of more like public with your books and um, want to keep writing. But for publishing, um, I think my journey, I, I feel like it was only a few years ago, although it feels like so long ago now, um, 2020 is when I really was like, everything shut down. It's when I wrote Lunar Love and started querying then too. And I think similarly, I, I, okay, so I'm a spreadsheet person and I kept very specific track of everything. I do it with my word counts. I do it with what I read. Like I love a spreadsheet. I love a list. 
And I tracked the entire process of who I queried, what happened with it, how long it took, dates. And so I could tell you exactly. I just don't have that up in front of me right now. So I don't remember. But it was relatively quick, I think, when I so when I started querying, I had the book ready. And I am someone who's like, it needs to be perfect before I do anything with it. And it was my husband who was like, you should try to query for an agent. And I was like, mm, like, that's a bad idea. Like, I, this is nowhere near ready for that. And he was like, well, they will help you get it in good shape, right? Like, that's got, like part of what they do. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I would just like Google everything of like, what is an agent? How do I get an agent, what is querying, and found so many resources and just self-taught it to myself, <laughs> taught it to myself. And I did get rejections and I actually like talking about this. I've talk, been talking about it more and I, I love to do it because <clears throat> I think it's important is when I queried our agent, our shared agent, I got a revise and resubmit and I had to redo some rehauling of the story and resubmit it to her. So I had a chance to take it back. It's an R&R &R and you kind of like take a little bit of feedback that the agent gives you and you choose to do something with it or not. And then you can edit and send it, resubmit it. And I chose to do that. I did take feedback. I changed the story a bit and I really, it was restructuring which taught me so much just even in those few lines of feedback. Um, our editor, our agent was an editor for 20 something years. So I personally wanted an editorial agent because I knew I just, I love to learn and grow. And I knew I have had a lot to do with um, growing and I still do. Um, so I r and R'd, and then I got the email saying, I'd like to have a phone call which I then Googled, what does it mean when an agent wants to have a phone call with you? What do you ask to an agent when you're on the phone call? And just kind of went, like learned as I went. And that, I, I believe that took under two months as well. And then I took the book back once we signed together, got the full editorial letter from my agent. There were more changes to make. And I think that process took uh, three months. So I did that. That was my three months of time. And I was so excited to go out on submission. And then we went on submission. And I think that also took under two or three months, which I think is relatively fast. Um, I think I get sweaty thinking about it because I am not a patient person. And I just like was obsessed with looking at my phone, checking my email. And kind of like another ironic story is that when I... The day that I was like, stop, put your phone across the room, do not check it for the, like, I missed the call no. about the, and the offer from my publisher. <laughs> oh my God. Of course. Of course. Um, so I, I get an email and it's like, our, our, my agent, our agent's like, give me a, call me. And I was like, scrambling for my phone like I call I call and I'm like oh my gosh what happened and that's how I learned it which was like not how I envisioned it in my mind I like had a whole different romantic view of it that didn't happen that way but so much of publishing really is hurry up and wait it feels so slow most of the time and um, I think that it feels the slowest when you're waiting for your debut to come out and then when more happens there are still times where you're like what's going on, it feels slow. But then if you can redirect your attention to like your job or your, like hanging out with your family and friends, traveling, figuring out your identity beyond books and writing, um, maybe even just writing the next thing and just keeping busy, I have found for that to be probably the healthiest way. Well, I don't know if it's healthy, but it is a good way to do it um, for me. Uh, so that you're not constantly like, what's going on, which is so out of your control. I, I completely agree. Um, it's tough, man. It's <laughs> Nobody tells you how tough it is. I am so excited to dive into a little bit more of the romance talk because I am not that good at writing romance. And <laughs> I commend people who are able to do it well. 
And like I always say, you know, it's the hardest job. We, you know they're supposed to end up together. You're going to piss a lot of people off if they don't. And you have to write it as if it's like, we don't know how it's going to end. And you have to make us fall in love with these characters and all of these things. So I want to dive a little bit more into that. Um, can you please talk about the, the complexities of writing romance and how you like to play with our emotions? No. <laughs> Um, no, but really, how is it that you guys know exactly what to say, what to write, what this guy's going to say to this girl to get <laughs> us to fall more and more in love with these characters? Lauren, you want to go for it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sure. Um, I'm thinking while I'll be talking, but um, I, for me, dialogue is... I, I say dialogue is my steam. So I write closed door romances and I rely very heavily on uh, dialogue and what they say to each other. So it's interesting thinking about the writing craft itself when you're thinking about romance or any genre that you're writing. And I think a lot of it uh, for me comes down to understanding the characters so that we know who it is we're who it is we're falling in love with as readers, but who the characters are falling in love with. So, when you're setting up your characters and thinking about the story and the plot, and I kind of like to do it all together. Um, our our agent is a very character driven agent, and I learned a lot about that from her. And my editor is really really great at plot. So I feel like I get a really great balance with both of them and um, the team is so incredible. So I feel like I'm just learning more along the way of how the two work together. But when I think about how the two will interact, a lot of it is like, are they opposites? What are the, in romance, there's a lot of tropes. So um, which tropes am I going to um, activate in a specific book and thinking about who they are and, and how they would say things, what they would say, how they would respond to things. Um, I, I, I guess I go through scenes like that. I also, having grown up on a lot of the romantic comedies from the 90s and 2000s, I just tend to, and I was a film major in school, so I just tend to think about things very visually, that when I set up scenes and chapters and I think about the arc of a book and what's going to happen and where they are, what they're doing, I just think very visually because that's just kind of where my brain goes and how I have been trained in a lot of like, my education. So I just, it's kind of like a mishmash of all of that. Okay. All right. How about you, Nanya? That's awesome. I, I really resonate with the whole mishmashing of things to make romance work because I think a good romance works because it feels like something that could happen to you. And you're kind of living vicariously through these characters that either represent something about you or something about someone that you love or something that you aspire to have. And I think that wish fulfillment comes from taking different mediums that can appeal to lots of different people and putting them together. So for me, the way I like to craft my romances is I like twists on tropes. And that's like kind of the entire brand of romance that I write. I like to take something we've seen before and add an external circumstance that would affect two people that aren't perfect and kind of force them to be better for each other. And I think that's the underlying theme in all of my love stories because I write for teenagers. And as we know, teenagers are a lot of things, but they're not perfect. And that comes out when they're trying to fall in love with each other at such a young age. So I rely really heavily on trying to create authentic teens that are learning, they're growing, they're making mistakes, but they're also figuring out how to be accepted with those mistakes. And then I take that and I pair it with something that's kind of out of this world unconventional. So my first book was, what if we took fake dating but we had them at the mercy of a prophecy and the universe and astrology and things that feel bigger than life. What if they were actually right in front of you? And what if they were actively influencing the way you fell in love at 17? And I think that helps bring a twist on those tropes that we see all the time. Um, and then my second book is of a similar sort of, you have this couple that's been together for four years because of that same prophecy that's like, you're gonna be together. The first person you date is gonna be your husband. So that means you never actually have to work to be in love ever. 
so what happens when you tell a 17 year old girl she doesn't actually have to work to be in love you get constant breakups you get lots of fighting mismatched communication styles you don't really know each other on a deep level because you think everything's always going to work out and then i went and i put them in a time loop so they have to figure it out otherwise they're not allowed to leave um so i think that's kind of like how i like to write romance i think it's a bit unconventional but whatever i feel entertained writing is what i hope also keeps an audience entertained and given my background in thrillers it kind of takes a lot for me to be like, oh my gosh, okay, something's happening. And it's, you know, I just, I like having that extra layer to romance because that's what I like to read. And that's what I like to write. And it comes out in that. Beautiful too. You know, one writer once told me that in, in every author's work, there's a singular question that every author is trying to ask themselves through the, the books and the characters that they write. So I'm going to pose this question to both of you with writing romance specifically. Do you think you know the question that you're trying to answer with the type of books that you write? What is that thread that sort of loops them all together? I know it's a tough one. I'll give you a little bit of, little bit, if you know, you can say it. <laughs> I th I think I you know I'm trying to figure out a way to phrase this eloquently in like my like author voice, um, which is hard sometimes to do. <laughs> um, but I guess I think the theme in all my books and in the books I want to keep writing and the ideas that I have is how do you love someone and stay loving someone when they are not perfect and when they are not the idea of the person that you wanted to fall in love with. And I think that's because I write for teens, because I was a teen not so long ago, that I'm kind of obsessed with this idea of falling in love, even if you haven't worked on yourself yet. Because I think there's always this kind of theme in social media when they talk about love and movies and they talk about love that's like, you figure out yourself, you be perfect. Everything that you need to work out, you work out. And then love is gonna just naturally fit into the picture afterwards and everything happily ever after. And I don't think that's true, especially when you're falling in love at 17, you are you don't have it figured out. You think you do, but then you fall in love with this person and suddenly all these negative sides of yourself come out and they come out in a way that could ruin this beautiful thing that you have. So how do you love someone and continue to love someone while also learning how to love yourself? I think that's the author way of saying it right there. That was it. <laughs> you that was beautiful. It well, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think for me, um, I have specific themes that I think about for each book that I write that um, has like a bigger uh, meaning or message or something that I'm really trying to unpack in it. And um, so like in Lunar Love, that is the idea of compatibility versus incompatibility. What makes us compatible with another human being when there is this belief system in place um, or without it. And exploring that through the vehicle is a Chinese Zodiac matchmaking business. In book two, that idea is uh, the idea of what I had to call string mates, which is um, the red thread of fate version of soulmates. And is there really one person out there for you? How do you find them? And that is the journey that the characters take. How do you know when that person is that person on the other end of your red string when you so deeply believe in this? And then what does that look like for you when you don't believe in it and you are very hard and fast, hard and fast by the rules? Um, and then ultimately, the thread that kind of ties anything that I write is, ironically, the third book is called Yin Yang Love Song and I am balancing yin and yang. So that, that the brightness and the darkness of life and exploring how we fall in love when lives and people are messy. How do we continue on? Bad things can be happening to us, hard things, scary things, great things. And all the while we can be falling in love during those times. And I think that is so beautiful and something that I try to explore. Um, certainly in, in Lunar Love, there is, there is a, um, light and dark element at play there. There's tough things that happen in that book. Um, and so 
while characters are falling in love. So I think that ultimately is what I am trying to uncover and unearth as I continue to, as I continue to write. Very beautiful. I love it. I think it's, you know, I, what it's teaching me is that writing romance, you guys are definitely very thoughtful about what you're doing and, and the why. And I love how incompatibility versus compatibility, these twists on these, you know, classic romance stories. And it's just kind of so creative. Oh. Ooh, I'm like, do I want to jump into craft now or do I want to ask another romance questions? Oh, by the way, anybody that is listening, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. You can ask them and we'll try to get to them in the Q&A at the end. Do you have any questions for the authors that you would like to ask? Now that you've written your, your first books and you, you've got them out of the way, what would be some advice that you would tell your younger self? It can be anything, but what would you, I'm going to rephrase it and say it more clearly, <laughs> say it like an interviewer. What advice would you give your younger self? Ouch. Writing your first book. It can be the process. It can be the after. I'm going to start with Lauren because she looks like she has an answer. <laughs> I think I do have an answer. And I am someone who I get a lot of satisfaction and esteem through my work. So like achievements. And I've, I've realized a lot about myself writing. I... I think I process a lot about things that I'm going through through my writing, uh, whether that is something cultural and learning more about my cultures, which is a lifelong journey that I will be on. It's something that I explored in Lunar Love with being mixed race and how it feels like sometimes we're not enough or any of the cultures that we're a part of um, and where we come from. And in, um, or if I'm exploring, um, imposter syndrome with feeling like there's like uh, creativity, whether you are in the corporate world or an artist or whatever your job may be, whatever your hobbies may be, there might be a sticking feeling of imposter syndrome that comes up. And so something that I do is um, process that, but I feel like I have worked it's when you're working a job and you're writing, it's a lot of work all the time. And I think my my advice would be to my younger self is to kind of goes back to that writer identity thing of like figuring out who you are before you let your work define who you are and to take care of yourself. Um, it's so easy to just stay up really late and wake up really early and not get sleep and just push, push, push until you are checking everything off your list and you're feeling like you're doing something right because you are accomplishing and then you get sick and then you have health compromises and then you have things happen and the world kind of slows you down for you and you don't learn that until it's too late sometimes so i think it's so 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 important to take care of yourself and your mental health um, and to pace yourself a little bit even when it feels like this is it, this is the moment, this is what I need to be doing and I can't stop. No one ever talks about the anxiety you have. <laughs> like it's so intense before that first book comes out. I don't know about you, I'm gonna share something that I, I'm not, I'm like, should I share it? But I had like this, this horrible feeling of like, am I gonna like pass away before my first book comes? <laughs> And I had to talk to people about it because I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would feel like it seemed like it took so long that what if something bad happens to me before someone can get the opportunity to read my work, hear my voice and, and see what this impression, this mark that I would like to leave on the world. And so that's kind of what it felt like for me in, in the beginning. So hearing that you like you, you said what you said, I'm like, yes, I think mine was a bit more extreme, but there's. Know. No, thank I, you for sharing. Thank you. No, thank you so much for sharing that. And your story reminds me of a line from Hamilton. <laughs> I think about this a lot too. Um, why do you write like you're running out of time? Mm. And I think about that song and that line, that, I mean, honestly, the whole thing so often. 
of like this man who was just writing, writing, writing so much before, I mean, you know, the story, but like, I just think that's, I feel like that a lot where I'm just like, why am I writing? Like I'm running out of time. Like, why do I feel like that urgency? Yeah. I'm definitely happy I'm over that now, but it's just a little warning to those who are watching. If you have that, it's normal. A lot of us do have those sort of anxieties and those insecurities and imposter syndrome. It's perfectly normal. Not saying it's healthy, but normal. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What about you, Ananya? Honestly, it's really along the lines of like the writing until you're running out of time. I think the way I started in publishing and the age at which I started publishing really colors my perception looking back on it. If I were to tell um, 17 year old me before she started this journey something, it would be that you like your career is not going to be defined by the book you write at 17, unless you let it, unless you decide to stop there, which is also okay if that's what like 17 year old me wanted. But my goal in writing and in publishing was just to write and to write books that would resonate with that one Indian American girl that I wrote this book in mind for. And it's really easy to get caught up in, you know, why didn't I get to go to this festival? Or why didn't my book hit the list? Or why didn't I get this much money when people said I would be more? People promised me so much. Why did that not happen? It's really easy to feel those feelings. And I, I think they're natural. But I also think that that's not why we started. Like we said in the beginning, right? We're not here because the money is so good. That's why we have all day jobs. <laughs> um, but we're here because we have this huge theme that we want to convey. We have this idea or this legacy that we want to leave to another generation of people. And I think for me, I just want to make sure that I keep writing books for that specific demographic, because that is my goal. That is my ultimate like dream in writing is that the right Indian girls find my book and can resonate with it. And their life might be better after reading it than before they did. So I think for me, it's like remembering I'm not running out of time. I can write more books. I can have more chances at those accomplishments and those achievements, but that doesn't matter because your first book did the job you wanted it to do. So even if you stopped here, it would be okay. But you're not going to because you like writing. And I think that's just having that balance because I think we're all very type A people who really you know, want to be the top. We want to be the bestseller. We want to be the household name. And I think that comes with time sometimes it happens overnight for people other times it's a slow burn but that doesn't mean the work doesn't have value and it doesn't mean that your contribution to that work doesn't have value I think it's just measured in different ways man very well it sounds like a future doctor that we have (laughs) (laughs) that was very well said um time is going by so quickly for me and I'm like questions okay so for Everybody that's watching craft questions. I love craft questions. Aw. And um, like what's, uh, so, okay, I'm, I guess I'm going to ask, we have an idea of some of the writing habits. Some may be good, some not so good. Um, tell me, how do you guys decide how to structure your romance stories? Do you know your ending? Um, do you know your twist? Any Anything that you can give us to tell us how you do the amazing things you do? I can, I can start with this one. Yeah, sure. um, I, I've written completely different structures for my first and my second book. So structure for me is not a template. It's not really something that I kind of go in knowing. I write books in like a weird plotting, pantsing in between where I am pantsing the structure and the plot, but I'm actually plotting out the characters and the themes of the romance. So I know exactly what character I'm writing going into it. I have no clue what they're actually going to do once they're in the book besides the big pitch point or like that elevator pitch of like, girl gets prophecy, prophecy equals destiny, girl fights destiny. I don't really know more than that going into a book. So my structure is like probably the biggest mystery that I find out at the end of writing. It's also my the favorite target for my editor and my agent because it's obviously the least developed when I first write a book and that's where it needs the most work. But for my first book, the structure followed a traditional rom-com. You have your third act breakup, 
you have, you know, these two characters that have to grow in specific ways in order to be worthy of loving each other. They have their fights, they have their arguments, they have their really cute scenes, but it's following that typical structure. My second book um, has two characters, obviously, that are stuck in a time loop, but they're breaking up every time loop. So your entire middle of the book, 50% of the book is a breakup. And they start out in happily ever after, and they have to end in happily ever after with breakups in between. So the structure just went out the window for that one. And and I ended up having to take on the structure of science fiction time loops and then make the romance almost a secondary theme to the actual plot in the world building, which I've never had to do before. Ambitious project. I'm glad I have an extra year on it. It really didn't need it. (laughs) But I do feel like for romance, Everyone likes to say that the structure is just happily ever after. Get to happily ever after, it's fine. But I think it's a lot more complex than that because romance comes in so many different formats. And the structure is dependent on the kind of romance you want to tell. Are you writing 50 breakups in a row? Your structure is going to be completely different than if you're writing one breakup that ends up leading you to happily ever after. So I like to be surprised and I like to figure it out as I go. But I also love taking inspiration and craft tips from other genres because I think they do structure in a way that's different from romance and can bring another level and complexity to the romance that we currently write. Great. What about you, Lauren? I'm like taking notes. Um, Yes, uh, a a lot about that um, resonates. I feel like when I started writing, I just started writing and there's a version of um, Lunar Love before I totally rewrote it and realized that there are beats and a lot of romances have these beats. As Ananya said, there's a third act breakup oftentimes. Um, There's the the happy ever after type ending, um, characters that up together. There's a meet cute. So there are things that happen along the way that I think, which is, I think it's why romance is so beloved is it's this very comfortable, um, setting story setting that you know you are going to have all of those cozy elements that you love but the how will be different so these characters will have a happy ever after but how will they fall in love and that is the the element that i know i show up for i'm there to see how two people will fall in love and i think about this because i still i felt so like new when i wrote my second book i had just sold the two book deal. And I jumped right into writing my second book. And in red string theory, these two characters spend a magical night together in New York city. And that takes up a good part of the first chunk of the book. And I was so nervous that everyone would be like, you can't do that. Like you cannot have it be X many chapters and have them be in New York this whole time and like on this one night and like within five to six hours. And I was like, but why not? Because I really want to show, I have to show that these characters are fated. Like I have to show readers that they are meant to be. There's a red string, but they, they spend this night together, but they actively purposely do not talk about what they do in their careers because they both had bad days. They don't want to talk about it. So the whole night, they actually don't know who they are. He doesn't know she's an artist. Rooney doesn't know Jack is a systems engineer at NASA. He only knows that she lives in New York. He lives in LA. And so they do a lantern chase throughout New York City on the night at the Lantern Festival. And it takes them all around the city. And so structurally, that made me very nervous. But it felt very right. So I think about beats. I'm an outliner, but I also, when I'm lost, think about my instinct of what I would want to see and what that story should be. So I do outline very detailed and again, with like the spreadsheet concept, it's not in a spreadsheet, but um, it's that concept. And then I let the characters come to life. So I have the elements that I want to hit and I know, I need to know where I'm going. I need to have a roadmap in order to feel like I can pick up the next day and keep going. But the characters at some point will come to life and I want to let them come to life. So they'll tell me where they want to go once I get to know them better. Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to rewind this, replay this, <laughs> <laughs> write down all of the notes. These are great tips, guys. Thank you. 
we've come to a very special part where I love to ask, would you rather experience questions? And I'm gonna give you two options and it's gonna be quick and rapid fire questions and you can tell me which one you choose. I'm not trying to get you in trouble with the romance community or anything, but <laughs> I'm gonna start off hard. You're not gonna start really, look. <laughs> First, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice, the American version or the British version? Look at their face. Like the BBC or the movie with Keira Knightley? Keira Knightley. Keira Knightley, okay. Keira Knightley. Ooh. I was having trouble differentiating until you yeah. said Keira Knightley. Keira Knightley or the other one. Look, <laughs> some people are going to get mad. Like, no, no, it's the other one. Um, let's forget we haven't all found our perfect people. Are we doing ponytails or short haircut waves in your romance novels. Would you rather write about which one of these types of gentlemen? I'm trying to envision short haircut waves. Yeah, which one, no, or uh, curly hair, short curly hair. Which short one works hair. better in the romance? Ponytails, man buns. No, I'm giving you more options, but like what hairstyle is the go-to hairstyle? Short, short. Short. Yeah. I like short curly hair. It gives you the opportunity to write that line that's like you run his fingers through his your fingers through his curls. Like that's like an important line. <laughs> I'm thinking Fabio hair, just like <laughs> um, love triangle or enemies to lover stories. Enemies to lovers. I am personally not a fan of either. Ooh, but I which, will say enemies to lovers. No, you I think can write in. I will let you write in one. Which one would you choose? If I write in, it's best friends to lovers. I'm a very predictable person. <laughs> oh, no, right. Since you both have dang dabbled in this, prophecy or arranged marriage? Prophecy. Prophecy. Mm, very nice. Better text message or phone call? Which ones come across better when you're writing? Text message for the age of my characters. I personally prefer phone calls when I'm doing like big conversations, but I don't think um, that's typically how I communicate. And most people my age communicate text messages. Me too. I am not a phone call person. Do not call me. <laughs> it's what's interesting is these days you never really read books where they're like and then they talked on the phone and the phone, mm -hmm. phone conversation it's always text message now and even some people they posted the messages you can read and I'm like well I'm older it's like back in the 90s people would leave you music voicemail messages and they would talk over the music oh hey my girl gosh. I was thinking about you <laughs> it's it, it's classic very classic stuff um Picnic at a secluded beach or candlelit rooftop dinner? Candlelit rooftop. Picnic at the beach. Okay. Getting stuck in an elevator or stuck indoors? Elevator. Did you say stuck indoors? Yeah, just stuck indoors somewhere, can't get out. Yeah, indoors. Like, elevator sounds frightening. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then last one, a slow burn romance with those like tension filled longing glances and, you know, subtle touches or a whirlwind romance that just everything happens quickly and everything spontaneous and amazing. Oh, I write slow burns, but my real life was a whirlwind. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to be thinking about that. Word for word, I was going to say what Lauren said. I write slow burns. I had a whirlwind. <laughs> so it's just funny how it happens that way. Yeah. I love watching slow burn. I love it. The little, the little subtle looks across the glances, and I love that. Um, but mine was also a whirlwind romance. <laughs> In like a month, it was like, doo, 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 done. Um, well, this is amazing. Do we have any questions for anybody watching? I don't see anything in the Q&A. Any questions in the chat? Okay, one last thing before we go. I asked two of our amazing authors to prepare a question for each other. Who would like to go? 
first. I'm going to pick someone. Look, <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to go first. I, I have a little bit of a longer question for you. Okay. Um, okay. So um, you have three books that are about to be out, and that is so exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, as someone in publishing, I know that if you have your third book coming out, that means at one point you were drafting book three, revising book two, and marketing book one. So how did you balance all of those things, and how do you keep the motivation and excitement about writing and publishing in the middle of all of that? Just my like a thousand mile glare just go because that's the question I I'm currently editing it and I just I mean I wrote it over the summer uh late summer early fall and I was promoting the second book and still kind of coming off of the first and wanting to keep that going too and it was such a new challenge to spin all of those plates at once and how what happened I I think at some point I just had to like taper off Lunar Love and kind of like keep some posts going, still kind of talk about it. And then for Red String, I I did a lot of like posts closer to the, the pub date and a lot doesn't happen up until kind of like closer to. So I had the fall to kind of like get a lot of that, my writing done before the promotion really picked up. And then now I'm in edits and I'm, still promoting book two, Red String. And I feel like at this point, people are annoyed or just like, don't want to hear from me anymore. So I'm like, okay, I'll just like cool it with like book, like Red String promo. And we're, you know, we're like three months away from it having been out. So at this point, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm going to talk about my, like my life online and like things like that. And then I'm, I'm editing. So I'm like really trying to keep my head in the, in this world, but it was, I think it was hard to keep my head. I was doing so much editing and writing with book three that like, honestly, like anything related to red string, I was kind of like, okay. Like I felt like I felt a little less anxiety because I was so invested in different people, different characters. I don't have the best answer, but I, I write a lot of things down like tangibly, like I just have a lot of lists. I keep a lot of notebooks. I have a social media calendar. I write, I have my writing, dedicated writing hours after work. Um, and I lost a lot of sleep, which probably wasn't great. It wasn't great for January. Um, but still we persist. You're doing amazing. I think it's incredible how many incredible books you've put out and like, I just, I read two of them already and I think they're just wonderful works of art. So I hope you can do oh, nice. it. You read, you read all two. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you for your question. Okay, my question to you. So of, of everything of your, we debuted in the same year and with the ups and downs and everything and, and everything you talked about too, just in this one hour, what has your favorite part of the entire process been so far? That's a great question. I love thinking about that because I think it makes it all feel worth it, right? Um, I have two answers. Um, one that's more on the publishing side of things and one that's more on the active having a book out side of things because I think they're very separate. Um, the best part of having a book out is getting DMs from 14 year old girls who are like, you just wrote my entire life thank you. And then they get so excited when I respond because I think they forget that I'm like a person who also uses my social media frequently when I don't want to study. So then they'll be like, oh my God, you responded. That's so cool. And I just think like it reminds me of who I was when I was writing books and trying to communicate with authors and be a part of this world. It just warms my heart to know that those girls have the book that they want and have always wanted. So never get tired of that. Send me all your DMs. I think that's so cute. Um, so that's number one. And the other favorite part I think of debuting has been getting to talk about the book of my heart and getting to actually be around people who want to listen to it. I, I've never really been surrounded, like my family members are very supportive, but they don't under, really understand what writing is. They don't understand how much of yourself you pour into your books. So to be around people that ask you questions about craft, that ask you questions about 
like how it was writing this book and getting to meet them, getting to hear about their lives and their experiences with writing. It's just been phenomenal. It's why I love festivals and panels and things like that so much because it's just a form of connection over something we have in common. And I don't think we get that very often. It's not like we all work in the same office. So things like this are always my favorite part of writing. Oh, that's really nice. It's a beautiful way to think about it. Love that. Thank, Thank you. you. That's so lovely. So guys, we've come to that amazing moment, the end of this particular panel. I want to say thank you to our amazing authors who were so kind to share an hour of their time with us. Um, if you guys love this panel, we do have another one coming up. Um, we have we books for like the rest of the month, but the next one is Tuesday the 19th um, at, I believe, four o'clock um, because we have an international guest uh, coming on. So if you guys are interested, please look in the sign up and, and see if you guys can come around for that. And um, we're signing off. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful night. You guys thank stay you. cool. <laughs> Bye. Bye guys. <laughs>